picture Zacchaeus as a boy, as this short, scrawny-looking little kid who's just trying to fit in. And, uh, you know, the rest of the kids tease him and bully him for his lack of height and probable lack of athletic ability. Zacchaeus is always the kid who's chosen last when other kids choose teams. And so Zacchaeus eventually just kind of gives up on trying to play with the other kids all together and, and focuses his energies into doing well in school and later in business. He goes to school for business and works really hard, unencumbered by the distractions of a social life, Zacchaeus becomes very successful. Now he's an adult. He's a powerful businessman who uses his power and his position as a tax collector to get revenge on the people who once hurt him so badly as a child. Okay, I know I'm using my imagination a little bit, but it, my imagination is consistent with the facts. He was short, didn't have any friends, and he had chosen a career that allowed him to get revenge on people who had hurt him. See, Zacchaeus had taken up with the Romans and their system of domination and oppression. You have to understand, the IRS has nothing on the Romans. The, the Romans would come into a nation where they had conquered, and they would erase the middle class, forcing everyone into poverty. And they did it through a system of taxation and people like Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus had chosen a career that allowed him to hurt his own people, the Jews. What would make a man do that? See, I'm not just using my imagination. I'm also using my knowledge of human nature. It is quite likely possible that, that kids tease Zacchaeus when he was a boy because he was short. Human nature. And then Zacchaeus allowed anger and resentment to grow. Human nature. And then he channeled, channeled the energy from that anger and that resentment into doing really well in school and in business. Human nature. And then he chose a career that allowed him to get back at those people. And it very likely was the exact same people. Because, you know, in Zacchaeus' day, people didn't move around like they do today. You wouldn't go to school out of state and then take a job in Chicago, move to Seattle for a career move, and retire to Florida, right? That just didn't happen in Zacchaeus' day. No, people would live in the same town and work the same fields generation after generation after generation. So yes, it quite likely was the exact same people that teased Zacchaeus as a boy that he was now taxing into poverty. And I think that maybe even in some twisted sort of way, Zacchaeus thought that maybe he could use his power and his wealth and his social status to somehow earn their respect, their friendship, their approval, their acceptance. Of course, it didn't work. And now these people have all the more reason to dislike him as he works so hard every day, trying to take their money away from them. Human nature. And now we find Zacchaeus in, in Luke chapter 19. We find Zacchaeus standing on the road to Jericho. And if I'm right about all this, he's standing there in great pain and anger and resentment that's just been there since he was a child. And it has created this deep need inside of him and this complete emptiness inside of him. Oh, he, he, he got his revenge, but it didn't fill the emptiness inside. Oh, he tried to earn their, 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 their respect and their friendship and their acceptance through his power and wealth and social status, but that didn't work either. And now he's standing there on the road to Jericho as empty 
as ever. And then Jesus. And then Jesus walks by and chooses Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, I must stay at your house today. Imagine the joy that must have filled Zacchaeus' heart. It was quite likely the first time in his entire life that anyone has ever chosen Zacchaeus. And not just chosen him, chosen him first. And not just chosen by anyone. No, chosen by someone who counts. And, and so at that at that moment, right, Zacchaeus realizes, you know, he's no fool. Zacchaeus realizes that, you know, he doesn't deserve to be chosen by Jesus. He realizes that he doesn't, he just didn't choose him because he's done everything right. Jesus chose him in spite of the fact that he's made a mess of everything. And that realization, right, it creates a tremendous transformation in Zacchaeus, right? At that moment, his heart is completely changed. And he announces that he's going to give half, right, half of everything he owns to the poor. Right? Not a tithe, not 10%, half of everything he owns. And then he opens the, the doors for anyone who believes that they have been wronged by him to come and get recompense. One wonders if there will even be any money left by the end of the day. That's quite a transformation. So what can we learn from the story of Zacchaeus for us? Right? I believe that there's three things that we can learn from the story of Zacchaeus. The first one is that, that love acceptance and approval are things that cannot be earned. They must be given. And when Jesus chooses Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus stops trying to get other people to give him acceptance and approval. And he starts giving other people acceptance and approval. He stops trying to get other people to like and care about him and he starts to like and care about others, right? Specifically in the story, the poor, right? And this should, this should make you and I uncomfortable because there, 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 there are all kinds of times in our lives, we're all guilty of this, of, of well, you know, the, uh, we've all been in this situation where there's somebody that we like, want, somebody we want to be friends with, and they don't like us. They don't want to have anything to do with us, right? Or they just don't want to be, you know, really good friends. Or maybe we see a certain group of people, and we'd really like to hang out with that group of people and be accepted into that social group, but it's just not working. Or maybe there's, uh, you know, a, a boy or a girl that you like, and, but they don't seem to know you're even alive. Or whatever it is, whenever we're faced with those situations, and we've all been in those situations, we as humans usually do one of two things. The first is we'll try even harder to get that person or those people to like us, all right? Or we'll play the sour grapes thing and we'll say, ah, you know, I'll just find somebody else to like me and approve of me and give me acceptance. But Zacchaeus challenges us to pursue a third option, and that is to just give someone else unconditional love and acceptance and approval. And that's a challenge to all of us, right? I also want you to see how in this story, it is Jesus, when he chooses Zacchaeus, that he makes Zacchaeus' life count. Right? Up to this moment, Zacchaeus' life hasn't counted for anything except his, maybe his own bank account, right? But after this moment, Zacchaeus' life starts to count for a lot. It starts to touch a lot of people. In the same way, when Jesus chooses you and me, which for most of us was at our baptism, our lives begin to count. 
Okay, second thing that we, we can learn from the story of Zacchaeus today is that wealth, power, and social status are equally distributed in the kingdom of heaven. When Jesus chooses Zacchaeus, he forgives Zacchaeus' sins and gives him salvation to be sure. I mean, that's, that's implied. That's bedrock. But there's something else going on that Jesus is saving him from. He's, Jesus is saving him from the relentless pursuit of power, wealth, and social status. Because you see, up to this point in his life, Zacchaeus has been on this runaway train of trying to fill the emptiness inside of him with power, wealth, and social status. It hasn't worked, but it's the only thing he knows, so he just keeps doing it. But now, at the moment Jesus chooses Zacchaeus, Jesus fills that emptiness inside of him. Fills it completely, fills it in a way that only Jesus can fill the emptiness that's in all of us. And, and so now Zacchaeus, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't need the power and the wealth and the social status anymore, right? He gives it all away. Why does he give all of his money away? Because he doesn't need it anymore. Because the only reason he's ever needed it was to fill the emptiness inside, which no longer needs to be filled because it's filled with Jesus. This, again, should make you and me feel very uncomfortable Right? Because we're all guilty of this. I think that every single one of us, we've all, you know, we do this without even thinking about it. We do it unintentionally, without even, you know, unconsciously, but we will rely on our, our, our wealth and our social status to try to impress people and earn acceptance into, you know, the group of neighbors, or the parents at school, or the people at work, or that group of people, or the people at church, right? And we, all, we do it without even thinking. And, and if Zacchaeus were here today, he would say, look, folks, you got to get rid of that because it's killing you. And I ought to know because it was killing me. The third thing I think we can learn from the story of Zacchaeus this morning is that revenge never works. Up to this point, up to the point where Jesus chose Zacchaeus, his strategy was to just try to get revenge on the people who had hurt him. But now he changes his strategy completely and begins to not just forgive people, but to bless them. Now, that can be very hard to forgive someone. If someone has hurt you deeply, it is very hard to forgive them. But it's even harder to bless them. Right? And, oh, I don't know, maybe if someone comes to you, someone who's hurt you deeply comes to you and begs you for forgiveness and asks you, and, and, and what, then, then you know, it becomes a little bit easier to forgive them. But still, to then bless them, to actively want good things for them and to bless them, that's tough. And of course, if they haven't asked for forgiveness, if they are unrepentant, that's like the hardest thing that anyone can do is to forgive them. And then to bless that person, even when they're unrepentant. But look what Zacchaeus does. You remember in the story, after he uh, gets chosen by Jesus, the people start to grumble against him. They're not forgiving him. Jesus has forgiven him, but the people aren't. And yet still, Zacchaeus says, yeah, but I want you to come forward if I've wronged you, and I'm going to forgive, and I'm going to ask you for forgiveness, and I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you four times the amount of money that I've cheated you out of. Look at how effortlessly Zacchaeus seeks to bless the people, even when they didn't ask him for forgiveness. And again, this should make you and me uncomfortable because we have a tough time with that. I bet if I asked you right now to just picture in your mind's eye one person who has hurt you deeply in your life, we can all bring one name or face right, right, right there. And we all have struggled to forgive that person. We've struggled even more to, to bless that person. 
So if these three things that we've learned from this story uh, have convicted us a little bit, made us feel uncomfortable, good, right? Because that's what the Word of God is intended to do, to convict us of our sin. And so I've got good news for you this morning. You are forgiven. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you are forgiven. Once upon a time, there was a woman who lived in fear of her father. Oh, it's not that he ever hurt her physically, but she lived in fear of those words that would, that that, that proved to her that she had to earn his love, acceptance, and approval. And it became obvious to her that she would never be good enough. She would never earn that. You know, the greatest gift that a father can give to his daughter or his son is unconditional love, acceptance, and approval. This was a gift she did not receive. And it colored everything about her life and the way she saw the world. It colored her relationships with men and women and friends and her family and everything. And all she ever wanted to do was to get back at her father. But this woman was a Christian. She was a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so she struggled mightily to receive unconditional love from her heavenly father. And when she did, she began to give unconditional love, acceptance, and approval to everyone. Oh, it started, it started just as, you know, uh, almost in spite of her father. I'll show him what it means to, to love people unconditionally. But it turned out that she was just blessed by the giving. And she changed her strategy of trying to get, get back at her father, and she just she tried, to, she tried to minister to him, but, you know, his shell was just too hard to crack scars ran too deep but she was able to receive unconditional love from her heavenly father that filled her completely on a warm sunny afternoon as the breeze blew lightly through the sycamore trees that lined the sandstone streets of Jericho, Jesus stopped and gave unconditional love, approval, and acceptance to a man who desperately needed those things. Gave love, acceptance, and approval even though everything the man had done to try to deserve those things made him all the more undeserving. Jesus gave love, acceptance, and approval where there was no reason to give it and every reason not to. That was good news for Zacchaeus. And it's good news for us. Praise the Lord.